Hi, my name is Sandy. I am a double donor. And my understanding is, is that unusual? And both of my donations were anonymous. So I'm 55 now. I donated first in 2010, and I donated again in 2018. How did I get there? Well, about me, I guess I can say that I'm an entrepreneur. My husband and I have owned several businesses. I work in the education field at the same time at our local high school. And we're in the process of renovating a home and building another. And that's about that. So in 2009, I had heard a radio story on the CBC about a man who was looking for a liver donor. And he was the father of four children. I don't remember his name, but when I got home, I went on the internet to see if I could find this fellow. And unfortunately, I couldn't. So in the process of looking for him, I ran into the Toronto Hospital's UHN application to be a living liver donor. So I filled it out and I followed the process. And it was long and it was arduous and there was lots of testing. I live on Manitoulin Island, so it's not easy for me to get to the hospital. But I would go probably about once a month down south to have testing done. I was matched with somebody who I don't know who she was. But I am a my blood type is B positive, so it's not very common. And I was scheduled for surgery and my husband and I had gone down and he had joined me to be able to hold my hand afterwards. And everybody else in the prep room went to their surgical suites and, and I stayed there. And it turned out my recipient was having an allergic reaction to some, something. And so they delayed the surgery. In the meantime, before rescheduling, They decided to do a couple of extra tests on me and they determined that I have something called factor eight, which my understanding means that it's kind of the opposite of hemophilia and I'm an overclotter, not an underclotter. And subsequently I got tossed program and that was a really emotionally difficult thing. For me because I was so determined to move forward with helping whoever it was that was going to be getting half of my liver. And I begged them to see if there was something that they could do to change it. So they checked with several hematologists and they determined that the factor of harm to me uh, was very, very minimal. And that I would go on blood thinners afterwards so that I wouldn't be an overclotter. So they rescheduled the surgery and I donated my liver. This happened to also be during the G20 or the G8 summit and all of Toronto was in lockdown. And it was the strangest, most eerie thing ever because nobody could come and visit me. There were no cars on the streets and there were some protesters here and there. And so I kind of went through the hospital stay on my own, which was difficult, I think, parts of it. But the staff were amazing, so it was all doable. What I didn't realize after my surgery was that I was so bullheaded about making it happen that I didn't pay attention to the people who love me. And it turned out that after the surgery, people, people, my husband and my dad, and I'm sure my mom and and my siblings were all terrified because they felt that this was a very dangerous surgery, which it's not. But there is always risk. And I promised my husband I would not do this kind of thing again because he was so scared. 
and I consider myself a promise person who keeps promises, but turned out that high school that I work at, there was a young man who was in need of a kidney. So I begged my husband's forgiveness and that I was going to break my promise and I was going to donate again. As it turned out, that young man didn't match. So we were to go out as an unmatched pair and sort of join a daisy chain of people who can donate and people who will receive. And before that could even happen, he found a donor locally that was of the same blood type and that moved ahead. But I had already started the process of testing and, and I knew the surgery would not be as difficult as the first one. So I decided to donate anonymously. And strangely, very strangely, it coincided with my niece's wedding. I live in Ontario, but I was sent to Alberta, to Calgary, for the surgery. For somebody else who is B positive, I have no idea who it is. And I went to the wedding, <laughs> I went to the hospital, and I donated the kidney. It was very serendipitous in a lot of ways. Now, what I didn't understand after that surgery, that ended up actually being almost more difficult than the liver recovery because I had forgotten, literally forgotten, that I was in a car accident when I was 19. And the surgeon came in post-surgery and asked me why my kidney was so covered in scar tissue. <laughs> And it wasn't until after he left, I realized when I was 19 years old, I didn't realize, I remembered when I was 19 years old, I was rear-ended in a car accident and actually broke my back. <laughs> right where my kidneys are. But that's basically how I ended up donating two and a half organs. Because then when they take your liver, half of the liver, they also take your gallbladder. So. Half a liver, one kidney, a couple of years later. I'm extremely healthy. I haven't had any after effects other than occasionally somebody will get a peek at a scar when I'm wearing a short summer top or a bathing suit and, and I get an inquiry. But that thing. And sometimes I explain it and sometimes I don't because it's just well, it's just too big of a story. And sometimes the reactions are a little too hard to manage. Some people just think you're crazy for anonymously donating. And since I've done it twice, I guess I just look that much crazier. Say la vie. I'm happy for what I have done. I can, I can die knowing that I've done something good for somebody else. And that, although I don't have children in, of my own, that somehow I will live on maybe in somebody else. And maybe that's the best part from my perspective, the selfish part. Anyway, that's my story. The whole thing to me was never scary. Mm -hmm. I, I was never worried that I wouldn't be okay. The needles that I had to give myself after the liver to be a blood thinner, that wasn't a lot of fun to start off with, but it was a, a minor duty that I did it on a daily basis for a little while. But no, I guess I was surprised by how other people around me reacted more than anything else. That it's really reasonable to be scared because somebody's taking a risk that is unnecessary for themselves specifically, but that not only has this been done so many times that I think that it's come to a level of safety and almost normalcy that it's not near as scary as the, there's a lot less unknown. There's been so many of them. There's been so many different transplants that truly 
fear should be the least of your concerns in regards to the hands that whomever your loved one is in because the surgeons are amazing. It's time consuming. There, there's no question. And, you know, you, you have to have an employer who's, you know, who's willing to take the ride with you because it is, it is time off and, and it is a lot of testing necessarily. But the, the, basically the, I don't know, the, the, the ends certainly more than justifies the means. Quick answer is because I can, because I could, but don't really know that I have a, a proper answer. The kids at the high school asked me the same thing. And the best thing I could say was it was one thing that I could point to that I knew I had done right in, in, in my life. But I think it's still kind of a, a mystery to me as to why I was so intent on, on making it happen. If, if, I, if I can share or give somebody else the opportunities that I have had, then it only seems like a reasonable responsibility to take on. Yes, yes. <laughs> I would. Um, um, because what a privilege that would be to be able to to touch the face that you've had the opportunity to be a part of in 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 some you know unusual way but yeah i'd, I'd love to meet them yeah that, that, that's the best i can give you is a yes <laughs> yeah i i can understand that but if i could donate a third time i would just because the first two were 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 so smooth and and, and so easy to be honest but Afterwards, it just sort of became a commonality in my life. And there was nothing particularly odd or special about it. It was just a, an event that happened then and now I'm here now. And until somebody sees the scar or we purposefully talk about it for whatever reason, I don't think about it at all. And so... Yeah, there's just, there's, there's very little after effects, except if I was to meet them, maybe that would make it more tangible from my perspective. Cause right now they're just a face with, without any features. Sure. One, I'm a good healer. <laughs> so my scars aren't bad at all. And, and they healed very quickly. One is 11 inches and the other one is nine. So they're significant, but I, I healed very, very well from them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change them. I don't dislike them. It's just a reminder on occasion that, you know, that they, these marks come from something positive. That would be the hardest part, would be the waiting for somebody, a match, to come along. That, that's got to be harder than the decision to donate because I can tell you when I am ready to donate, but I can't tell you when you're going to get your organ. And that the unknown would be really, really frightening. So I think it's really, really brave and a real sense of determination that comes from somebody who sits on the waiting list, particularly with an unusual blood type. That, that's got to add more anxiety to, to the process. But the more people that, that know that this is not a horrible thing or horribly hard thing to do, the more likely that those people will get the donation that they need so I, i'm i'm more than happy to say i love my scars and the process 
at times was hard, but it was it was more than than I could have ever imagined it would be for me. And and if I ever get the opportunity to meet who has half my liver or or one of my kidneys. That that would be very meaningful for me. I'm a firm believer in communication uh, can can fix anything. And the more we communicate and the more that we are willing to listen, I think the more people can gain a longer lifespan through these surgeries and given the opportunity to have more time, I'd love to have it. But to be given the opportunity to give more time, there's no words for that. Thanks for the opportunity.